Owning a small business can be overwhelming. How can your business stand out and connect with customers? Easy. Get Constant Contact. There's so many places to reach customers. Email, text messages, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, live events. The list goes on. How are you, as the business owner, expected to own all of those channels? That's where Constant Contact comes in to help. With Constant Contact, you'll reach new audiences, grow your customer list, and communicate more effectively to sell more, raise more, and fast-track growth. I use this to grow my email list, and you should too. So get going and start growing your business today with a free trial at ConstantContact.com. Just go to ConstantContact.com right now. Constant Contact, helping the small stand tall. ConstantContact.com. Your favorite source for Chicago White Sox talk, delivering news, interviews, analysis, and more. This is the Sox Machine Podcast with your hosts, Jim Margulis, James Fegan, and Josh Nelson. Thanks, Rob, and welcome to a new episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Nelson, and it's Monday, April 8th, 2024. Today is a solar eclipse day, which will be the first eclipse visible in the United States since 2017. Cleveland is in the path of the eclipse, and that's where the Chicago White Sox head next after they got swept in Kansas City. There's no easy way to say this. The White Sox are awful. After nine games, they are 1-8. and eight. They are 0-7 in the American League Central raising serious concerns if we are watching the worst White Sox team in franchise history. The lowest winning percentage by a White Sox team was the 1932 squad when they had a 325 winning percentage. That would be a 52 and 110 loss record today. What's causing problems for the White Sox? It's the offense, which will break down what's not working for the White Sox early. But there is some good news. The Birmingham Barons are off to a strong start in 2024, and Jim Margulis was there to see it in person. We'll also touch on what's going around Major League Baseball as the Athletics plan to play in Sacramento, and big-name pitchers are out for the season. Joining me in this episode is the managing editor of SoxMachine.com. It's Jim Margulis, and hello, Jim. Welcome back from Birmingham. Glad you made it home safely. James Fegan had a very light flight out of Kansas City and not able to join us for this recording. But I do want to start the show by thanking everyone who supports us on Patreon and visiting the site daily, listening to the podcast. Your guys' generous support made it possible for James to travel with the White Sox to Kansas City and for you, Jim, visiting the Bearings in Birmingham. And I think our coverage of the White Sox was much better for it. Yes, I agree. Uh, I'd like to think that you know having boots on the ground in two places is uh, is a major benefit. Also, the fact that boots in the ground in two places help us be able to change the subject effectively. Um, if we were both in Kansas City, we'd both have like re- reporting on double the misery and have nothing to say. So being able to go to Birmingham, which is you know they happen to win all three games, like it was very much a. Uh, a, a study of contrasts between what was happening in Kansas City, just, you know, pets' heads falling off, and Birmingham, where, like, everything's pretty good, actually. Like, players are as advertised or getting better, or if the guys are off to slow starts, other guys are off to fast starts. You know, the lineups make sense. The defense makes sense. Like, everything kind of is falling into place. You never know with the White Sox farm system how... Uh, long that'll last but like it was nice to be able to have that so like this week I'll have a bunch of stories based on what I found and we'll talk about a little bit here but uh, it'll be nice to have that variety of tone and topics because you can only look at the White Sox up top for so long this year yeah and I have a feeling as we progress with this podcast and maybe even some of our coverage on SoxMachine.com uh, looking at how the other affiliates are doing, maybe looking at other league trends because we love this sport and we don't want the White Sox to kill our love of baseball. But let's get into the White Sox news out of Kansas City. And this is the biggest topic, biggest headline the White Sox have as we're all holding our breath is there's no definitive timeline yet 
as Luis Robert Jr. is on the injured list with that right hip flexor injury. And there's a lot of things, like Bob Nightingale in his column is saying it's a severe injury, he's going to be out months. James is hearing other things, but not able to verify. We don't know yet until the White Sox tell everyone in the next press release about Luis Robert just exactly how long he's going to be out. But make no mistake, Jim, like this season was already going to be rough with a healthy Luis Robert. And now that Eloy Jimenez is already on the injured list and he had a setback as he was trying to get back into playing shape and get back into the White Sox lineup, not not having Robert in the lineup daily and not knowing how long he's going to be out makes this awful White Sox team just more awful. Like, what are your initial thoughts with Robert now on the injured list. Yeah, I mean, what else is there is the first thought. Um, you have you know, Andrew Vaughn, Dominic Fletcher. You know, perhaps those guys might be critical to the next good White Sox team. Like if somehow Vaughn makes strides or you know, Fletcher becomes like a an adequate defense or plus defense plus OBP right fielder, you can get by with him, you know, going on the Adam Eaton model. But like otherwise, yeah, it's... He was going to provide the highlights, like opening day, two homers against Kenta Maeda. Like, yeah, that was kind of the, or sorry, uh, the second game of the season, right? Uh, but yeah, just, you know, having those two um, bombs were like, oh, at least as long as Luis Roberts here, we'll have an at-bat to watch or we'll have some sensational plays. Somebody to kind of, if not like be like a, a city on the hill in terms of like for players to strive to at least like a, just a oasis of competence among uh, uh, a whole lot worse. So with him out, you're just left to the worst basically, especially since Eloy Jimenez is out since like Mancada seems like he's just 2021 mode kind of where there are some things he's doing okay and some things he's not doing okay and because nobody else is really stepping forward you're just frustrating by you're frustrated with uh, Mancata by him just being okay and you're just waiting out his contract too so yeah it's pretty brutal it, and problem is like the pitching's been okay like Garrett Crochet you know three for three in terms of like good starts you know good enough starts and Almost like watching the Bears all those years when they had defense and no offense. So like you go in the second half just waiting for that defense to crumble and you wait for like just the players to get worn down and like figuring like they go into the halftime just yelling at each other in the uh, locker room because of just like time and possession was like 80% uh, in their favor and we're gassed. And it kind of feels like the pitching is going to be the same thing unless they turn into like individual Dylan ceases to where like they're fine that they're pitching okay because they'll be traded to a contender and they just have to keep doing what they're doing and they'll be free from this hell soon enough. That's kind of what you're looking at right now with the major league team. Well, let's hope that it's better news than what it is now and that Robert returns to the White Sox sooner than later because if the White Sox have to go through their gauntlet of death that we are continuing to hype up for mid-May to late June that now 39 game stretch without Luis Robert woof like we're already looking at and maybe we're overthinking it maybe we're overreacting maybe we're not overreacting after nine games this White Sox team Jim has the feeling that we could be watching history but the wrong kind like this could be an all-time worse White Sox team in the 120 plus years of the franchise and and a big factor in why many are now wondering if this team not only is going to win 60 games, can they win 50 games this season? Is that simply put the offense sucks. Like prior to Sunday, the white Sox, before they had 12 hits were tied with the Miami Marlins for the lowest team weighted runs created plus at 61. That's 39% below league average. The White Sox had 12 hits. They scored three runs. The Miami Marlins, congratulations. They earned their first win of the 2024 season on Sunday. After Sunday's game, despite the 12 hits, the White Sox uh, as a team are hitting 196 below the Mendoza line. Their on-base percentage is 266, and they have a slugging percentage of 318. That is a 584 OPS. That is by far the worst in the American League, 
Only the New York Mets right now have a worse team OPS than the Chicago White Sox. And using runs per game for the White Sox franchise, again, over 120 years, which covers all the different rule changes, integration, changing the mound, the worst White Sox offense ever was the 1968 squad. They only averaged 2.86 runs per game. So over the course of 162 games, that's 463 runs scored total. The 2024 White Sox are averaging 1.78 runs per game. So this squad needs to average more than 2.92 runs per game for the rest of this season to avoid being the worst offense in franchise history. Jim, for my sanity, they have to. This White Sox team needs to figure out how to score three three runs a game because I don't know how many of us are going to be left if they continue to average 1.78 runs per game. If the White Sox have a little bit more name brand talent and also if they have some guys who might be able to provide some life, uh, say like uh, Colson Montgomery or Brian Ramos, wherever they call up, uh, in the second half of the season might be better than what they have, uh, then like they should be just probably an ordinary kind of terrible versus like cataclysmically uh, awful and uh, toxic and uh, you know everybody run away before you uh, you know just um, lose all senses uh, just from uh, just being inundated with with terrible baseball. So that's why I'm like I'm not rushing to you know smash those buttons yet, but like the elements are there just because we saw the White Sox give up last year. And we talked about it before, like with this whole idea of like guys on one-year contracts, guys who have uh, careers to play for, their backs are against the wall individually. So they're all going to come together because they all have to like put forth their best effort. But we're seeing like one, if they're just all bad and if they're at the end of the lines and the, you know, they're not going to get another major league contract after this one they're working on, you know, there's that. Uh, also like it could be a case of just, they feel nothing towards the collective effort of the, 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 the United project of the 2024 white Sox. Like I don't care. I'm not going to be here. Uh, I, I don't want to be associated with this. Like, I don't, you know, I don't want to be somebody who's like, Oh, I was a below average member of one of the worst teams in baseball, if not the worst. So this is where you get, uh, you know, 26 cabs uh, from the game uh, rather than any kind of like, you know, team that actually likes each other or is, you know, feels um, compelled to turn it around as a group. Uh, and Griffol, it does not seem like a, a leader of men. We'll put it that way. Uh, and, and he's counting down the days as well. So yeah, it's pretty much a, uh, you know, all the elements are here for like a disintegration. I, I'll give you that. And like, I'm prepared for like what happens if the White Sox are, nine and 50, uh, like the way that, you know, that territory that the A's were last year, but, uh, it could, you know, all it takes is like one good week to be bad. Like, <laughs> which is, uh, last year we're talking about like one good week and maybe they get, uh, over the hump and they're challenging the twins. And now this is like, just, just be like a, a regular kind of terrible that, <laughs> Doesn't yeah you know, that you don't worry about like either using sixty five players in a season or fights in the clubhouse or just forfeits because of just lack of, um you know a major league operation. Yeah, go three and seven in your next ten. <laughs> Triple the amount of wins that you have. Like be that level of bad. Not mm-hmm. not we're one and eight. Our one win maybe fluky win over the Atlanta Braves as. Their three run, uh, run driven hits, I think, had a batting average well below 300. I mean, Paul DeYoung's win aided home <laughs> run, a uh, huge difference in that game, had a expected batting average below 100. So thank you to Mother Nature for that stroke of luck. But the White Sox are 0 7 against the American League Central. Like they got swept by the Tigers at home, and now a four game sweep against the Royals. This could be an all-time terrible American League Central since its, its existence of the wild card era, Jim. And the White Sox are 0 7. Like, for all the White Sox fans in the Sox Machine comments that were trying to be optimistic before this season, 
They're like, just hold on here, guys. This division is going to be bad. We got a lot of division games to start the year. Maybe they could start hot. <laughs> now what? And I see you guys in the comments section. You're already checking out. I can't blame you. Like, you were so optimistic. You were so happy to see baseball. You were hoping, hoping that these one-year guys could come together, that these veterans could be dependable, and they could at least be 500 to start the first month of the season. No, they're 0-7 against the American League Central. Well, I'm looking at that 2003 uh, Tigers team. They went 43 and 119. And I remember that year, the White Sox had one of their like second place finishes. And part of the reason was that they were unremarkable against Detroit. They went uh, 11 and eight against them, which is fine in most years. Like you win a season series against like any divisional team, you know, you feel like if, well, if you do that against every divisional team, then you'll be okay. Uh, but looking at what the Tigers did, they, uh, the Twins won 15 of 19. So the uh, White Sox won 11 of 19 and the AL Central was decided by four games. So it feels like the White Sox could be that team where uh, the individual head-to-head record of each team against the White Sox might be uh, what you know divi- decides the division or at least decides the order of the division. And teams are saying, well, we won 85 games, but we barely won the season series whereas like the tigers won 11 of 13 and the guardians only won eight and that matters because uh nobody should have felt uh like a series loss against the white Sox was something that they could stomach the hot hitters for the white Sox. there's only two one of them is somebody that a lot of white Sox fans were wondering why they even made the opening day roster and that's gavin sheets Gavin Sheets is hitting 333, 500 on base percentage, slugging 611. He's got five walks to five strikeouts, and he's got a home run and two doubles. And as Jim mentioned earlier, Yohan Makata, I wouldn't be shocked if he finished his 2024 season with this slash line 273, a 424 slugging percentage. A 424 slugging percentage is not great. He has yet to hit a homer. It's a 792 OPS, and it would spark great debate online if Yohan Mikata is a good offensive player. But it's a decent batting average. He's drawing walks, but a big part of the reason this offense sucks is that there's just no power. And when you look at the cold hitters, like the Andrews, Ben Attendee, and Vaughn, neither has an extra base hit. Neither. Ben Attendee sitting 139. He's got a 184 on base percentage. He's only drawn two walks. Andrew Vaughn is hitting 194. He's got a 286 on base percentage. He's 6 for 31 to start this season. And Nicky Lopez is 4 for 21 to start the year. That's a 190 batting average. He's 0 for 4 in stolen base attempts, and I think you're going to write something about that to preview on SoxMachine.com about the loss in Nicky Lopez's speed. There's no closing speed. He's not fast. He, he is slow, and when he doesn't get good jumps on the bases, it is apparently clear this guy cannot steal bases. So, Nicky Lopez, that was fun. That was fun watching you get <laughs> picked off at second base four times. I don't need to see that again if you're not going to be faster or make better jumps. But out of the cold hitters, Jim, we got to circle Andrew Vaughn. Here's my hot take of all hot takes. I think the White Sox should option Andrew Vaughn and send him to Charlotte. Now, James Fegan, our colleague, says that's not going to happen because he spoke with White Sox hitting coach Eric Thames, and Thames told James that the biggest problem right now with Vaughn is the timing of his leg kick. And I guess the White Sox are going to have Vaughn figure out this issue in the major leagues. But what I'm suggesting here is that instead of watching Vaughn dig himself a deeper hole, Jim, that he may not be able to climb out of and save his 2024 season. That if he needs to work on timing, if he needs to work on his leg kick, go to Charlotte, demolish AAA pitching, get some confidence back, and then rejoin the White Sox in a couple of weeks. I'm not saying send him down for like half a season, but he's, he's clearly lost at the plate. And the game is finding Andrew Vaughn. He leads the team with nine with nine plate appearances with runners in scoring position. And when you have someone struggling as much as Andrew Vaughn 
and the game finds him in these critical clutch moments and he can't deliver, more and more pressure is going to be dropped on this guy's shoulders, especially with Luis Robert and Eloy Jimenez out of the lineup. And I don't want to see Andrew Vaughn break Jim. So if he needs a breather, if he needs to let's lessen the competition here and let's rediscover that confidence and bring you back, I'm all for it. He's got three options left. I don't think it really hurts the White Sox at this moment. I just think you got to avoid Andrew Vaughn batting like 150 in the first month of the season. And then we're worried about his confidence for the rest of the year. And you've already thrown so much at this guy. Like we could be at the breaking, we could be at the breaking point with Andrew Vaughn. And then what for the next couple of years of team control? Are the White Sox back at the drawing board and trying to find and develop a middle of the order bat in which that they, they thought they had in Andrew Vaughn? So that's my hot take. It's not going to happen, but that's what I would do for the next couple of weeks is to send Vaughn to Charlotte, beat up some AAA pitching to regain some confidence. It feels like you're trying to rediscover the Garrett Crochet will never work as a starter magic. You're trying to like, all right, if this is my hot takes are going to blow up in my face, let's use that force for good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can see where you're yeah, going. So uh, not really. That was not my thought, okay. but sure. Now, because, because we'll preview the Cleveland series here and yeah. Tristan McKenzie starting on Monday and Andrew Vaughn needs a day off. He's over 13 with six strikeouts against Tristan McKenzie. So I don't think you should have Vaughn in the lineup. But, like, yeah. again, no, I, I get, I, I'm going to be worried, Jim, yeah. if we roll the calendar to May 1st and Vaughn's OPS starts with a four. Like, that could wreck his season. It's, you know, it, it's a tough situation, I think, with Vaughn, partially because, like, it feels like a make or break year in terms of like, is he a part of this or not? Is he just a guy we're going to have playing first base and he's going to go through his arbitration years, but we're not going to be like anxious to keep him. Uh, we're, you know, if like, say they, you know, somehow draft a power hitting corner infielder that wants to play first base is like all of a sudden Vaughn, just a placeholder for the next guy up. So like, it feels like it's a crucial year for him. And, Part of me wonders, like, I think when you, like, talk about optioning a guy at AAA, I think part of me, when he looks this off, uh, there is, like, it invites the question, almost like the, uh, yeah, the the saying, like, you know, never ask a question you don't know the answer to. Uh, and it's a case of, like, if you send him to Charlotte, what if he's so off he doesn't hit Charlotte right away? And, like, yeah, then it just gets, like, really confidence destroying. So I think that's why, you know, it's not a move you make lightly. You're not a move to, like, get you back on track. I think, like, it needs to be, like, a four-alarm thing where almost, like, you, like, either, you know, make up an injury or, like, you know, respond to, like, the first possible, I need to miss a couple days for, uh, you know, a hangnail or something like that, and then say, like, well, you're on the in, uh, injured list with finger inflammation, and we'll send you down to Charlotte to do a rehab stint and see how that goes. And in the meantime, we will uh, play Gavin Sheets there because he looks worthwhile as a, you know, bat whereas there are very few White Sox hitters who do like I don't mind like the idea of like Vaughn playing less like I think it'd be a good place to start is like now you're a guy who can maybe face pitchers when you have the advantage like say Tristan McKenzie like no way <laughs> sit on the bench for that one uh Gavin Sheets you take that start Robbie Grossman, you're here, so Gavin Sheets doesn't have to play the outfield, or like we have a third outfielder, so Gavin Sheets can play first base. That's kind of how I look at it to start, is like you're not an everyday player if you're playing this poorly, and if somebody else who plays your position is playing well. And uh, that's where I'd start, because like the whole thing of like, yeah, I guess the White Sox, the way they've regarded Vaughn this entire time is like untouchable. That always confused me, because nothing about his skill set, when he, when he showed up like not hitting... 280 with uh 20 homers and like an on base percentage north of 350 drawing a lot of walks like once that guy didn't emerge i thought like why is this guy untouchable like he doesn't really do anything well he does a lot of things okay offensively like he takes a decent at bat with runners in scoring position what have you but like there's nothing here it says like he's a difference maker and so like if he's not if he's making the wrong kind of difference and i think you have to start like pulling some stops and saying like all right yeah you're no longer like penned into the lineup for the next seven days. We're going to look at each series and say, where you can do some damage, where you can play your way into the lineup, and when can you, uh, you make way for Gavin Sheets? Like, that's kind of how I'd start. And then 
use AAA, like keep that in the back pocket in case like it is, uh, you know, mid-May and he still looks lost and like something might need to be done. Uh, just because I think if you send him down while he's off and he looks even worse at Charlotte, it looks the same. Uh, he's getting lapped by, you know, whoever they have in the roster, like Zach Remillard or something like that. Like if, he, if he's getting outplayed by the Remillards and Danny Mendix of the world down there, just like that invites even more questions that you don't want to know. So I think first things first, there are some things you can do in the interim to kind of graduate your way towards that, I think, most drastic of options. Yeah, Vaughn will face a lefty, Logan Allen, in the upcoming series. Maybe he collects a couple of hits against Allen and gets going here. But I, okay, I, I'll go with your idea. Give Vaughn another month. Knowing Pedro Grafal, Andrew Vaughn is going to be in the lineup every single day, Jim. And with Vaughn in the lineup every single game, and where he's going to be batting in the lineup, which I'm going to assume will continue to be cleanup or batting fifth in the lineup. I think he, yeah, he batted fifth against Kansas City. No, he batted cleanup on Sunday. He's going to get all these plate appearances with runners in scoring position. And if he does not figure out this timing issue, then again, it raises the question, like, how are the White Sox going to score more? Well, other than hitting more solo home runs, they need the guys who are batting the middle of the order that are getting these plate appearances with runners in scoring position to pull through. And if Vaughn continues to not to pull through and the White Sox are continuing to struggle to score runs like they are right now, again, I, I'm going to be worried about the amount of pressure on him, breaking him. And I don't want the White Sox to break him. I thought when you mentioned the Andrew, I thought you were going to mention Andrew Benintendi. Uh, my fun fact for Andrew Benintendi, do you know what his maximum exit velocity is this year? 73 miles per hour. <laughs> uh, 99. Okay. Well, so he's not reached hundred miles per hour in a batted ball yet. Not even one in the ground. Kind of want him to just bunt every time. I think he'd have more success. The, the Benintendi signing Jim, that's going to easily go down as the worst white Sox free agent signing, right? Like, Way worse than the Yes Money Grandal signing, which wasn't that bad in the first place, but other White Sox podcasts have said that it was, and we've been disputing that fact for years. Jamie Navarro, yeah, I think is a standard bearer. Going back to him in terms of like pound for pound, uh, factoring the expectations of the team and disappointment. Ben Tenney will probably be the worst, but also feels just like the most pointless. Like, <laughs> doesn't that kind of add to the worst I've, feeling? It does, but it just almost feels like you know. Worse feels like it generated some like emotion or like, uh, you know, like Navarro, that one, a lot of emotion, Adam Dunn, a lot of emotion into that one, a lot of disappointment, anger, like conflict, uh, you know, arguments, etc. polarizing, even when he was good. And like, I think he played well enough at times to like get fans invested and then ultimately like didn't work out. Same thing with Grandal. Like he raised hopes enough to where like when the bottom fell out, everybody got really mad. And so they started calling him the worst. Even like the first two years of the contract were fine. Uh, ben Intendi just, he feels like so utterly irrelevant that, you know, like that's what, that's what's like, I think like it makes the White Sox look small more than it's like a reflection on him. Like once he signed the contract, it's like Andrew Benintendi is the highest paid free agent in franchise history. Like what kind of franchise is like, it almost feels like it's, it's a worse reflection on the White Sox. Uh, the fact that Andrew Benintendi is doing this poorly to where it's almost like less about him being the worst free agent uh, signing and more about the White Sox just being bad at this. If that makes so, sense. It, it does. It does. So to recap, Let's give on another month, but if he's hitting this poorly in mid-May, I think the White Sox should seriously consider sending him down to Charlotte to regain some confidence. And we agree, Andrew Benatendi is a waste of space right now. I don't know what he does well. Honestly, I don't know what he does <laughs> well. Other than he catches the ball. Uh, 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 <laughs> other than he catches the baseball when it's hit directly at him. I don't know what Andrew Benatendi does well. His He's, he's zero runs... Uh... Uh, or I, he's even when it comes to um, outs above average. So at zero, there you go. So like he's he he's not catches the ball. He's not doing the uh, you know the immediately horrible reads last year when he was fourteen runs negative. Uh, when it com comes to uh, run value, according to Statcast, the arm is a problem though. I think that's what we're seeing is it's like a huge problem. Yeah, the 
he's fine, like, tracking the ball. I think, like, he hasn't made any plays. Yeah, I missed a couple games here in Birmingham, but, like, I haven't noticed the, why didn't he get to that ball? Like, I've seen Luis Robert call him off on balls in his jurisdiction, mm -hmm. but, you know, I haven't seen the, wow, he should have got to that, but I've seen the, wow, he gave him an extra base on that ball, uh, on, on tag-ups that shouldn't have happened. Like, I've seen more of that this year, and that feels like it's going to be a recurring trend. Ben Attendi, in this series, caught a ball, shy of the warning track, was in position, got himself into throwing position, planted the back foot, made a throw that Salvador Perez tagged from second base and reached third. On a fly ball to left field, Salvador Perez tagged up at second and reached third on off of Andrew Benatendi. It is a 30-grade arm for Andrew Benatendi in left field. I just... Again, it, the game right now for the White Sox in these tight, awful games are finding Andrew Vaughn and Andrew Benatendi, and both of them are failing a great deal. And if there's going to be some screaming from the pitching staff, those would be the first two players I'd start screaming at. And uh, it does raise the question with this upcoming series for the White Sox, what do you think would be more painful to stare at? The White Sox offense or the solar eclipse, Jim? Do you got a pick? What would be more painful to look at? Probably the eclipse. Probably. Probably. Not a given. I, I mostly say that <laughs> so we're not held liable to where like somebody twists it to being like, oh, yeah, I heard it was safer than watching the White Sox offense. And all of a sudden we get sued. So yeah. let's make that very clear that do not stare at the eclipse. Please don't. The White Sox offense won't blind you. Uh, the Eclipse will. Although I think it was uh, John Greenberg who said, like, you can imagine, like, at least one player on the White Sox missing the series because they looked at the Eclipse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, again, don't look at the Eclipse. Don't even look directly at it, even if you have those types of glasses. Just be careful on Monday. We're going to take a quick moment for a word from our sponsors, but coming up next, let's hear about Jim's trip to Birmingham. Quickly touch on the White Sox next series against the Cleveland Guardians and look around what else is happening in Major League Baseball next on the Sox Machine Podcast. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying Major League Baseball tickets. Worked great last year when I visited Seattle for the first time, attending Felix Hernandez's jersey retirement ceremony. If you are in Cleveland for this series, Game Time has tickets for the Guardians home opener and tickets under $15 for the Tuesday and Wednesday games. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use our promo code SOXMACHINE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem our code SOXMACHINE for $20 off. Game Time. Last minute tickets. Lowest price. Guaranteed. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Welcome back to the Sox Machine Podcast. All right, let's talk about something happy here. Something positive. Jim visited the Birmingham Barons. Now, typically... It's not always a happy visit to Birmingham, especially when you look at wins and losses. 
The Barons are a top class organization led by Jonathan Nelson. No relation. Regents Field is awesome. The area around the stadium is awesome. The play on the field has not been awesome for the Barons for a few years. A very strong start, though, to the 2024 season. And for this improving White Sox farm system, a lot of the big guys in the top 10, top 15 are with the Barons. So, Jim, what did we learn going to Birmingham and chilling with the Barons for their opening weekend? Well, they're 3-0, and which is remarkable when it comes to, like, White Sox uh, full season affiliates. Uh, looking at their records as a group past three seasons, they've been a bottom three organization in terms of uh, wins and losses. You know, adding all four affiliates together, like the organizational standings is what Baseball America says. They've been bottom three, uh, been pretty miserable. Uh, and the Barons have been, you know, stuck in the middle of that. It's like they're kind of uh, torn between like, uh, you know, the good players get thrust up to Charlotte because Charlotte needs bodies. And then players in Charlotte need to go up to Chicago because Chicago needs bodies. And like the uh, players who are drafted, like the high school players, like the are matriculating too slowly to get to Birmingham. So it seems like Winston Salem, like when things are going poorly, like Winston Salem is in that sweet spot of like having enough, like precocious talent that actually can deliver once in a while. And some older talent that can handle high a, uh, that they do. Okay. But like, then there's just a wall that, players don't get to Birmingham. And so they're just kind of left thin. So looking at the roster this year, uh, when I previewed it and, you know, getting down to the, uh, getting down to the park, like it looked like this, you know, I've been fooled before, uh, but looking at the roster, like this is like a good team. Like it's, it's a well-balanced team uh, starting pitching. Like I would like to see all five starters pitch. You have uh, Jake Eater went today. He had Drew Thorpe and Jairo Iriarte. You got Kai Bush and then Mason Adams. Like all five of those guys deserve to be starting a double A. And they're all young and you know, either young or like young for experience, like older draft picks, but are at double A on time to where like they couldn't possibly get there any earlier. So let's see what they can do. So like, you know, when you have starters every day who are worthy of starts that's that's a feat you know you don't have to scramble for like three innings at a time and put together bullpen days you know the bullpen doesn't look that impressive in terms of name brand talent but like double a bullpens are kind of like that just you know you, you get random success stories if they were better they'd either be like up the ladder or they'd be um you know in the rotation so uh double a bullpens are kind of where you know random guys emerge and so far they've they've held serve and then, like, the lineup, like, it's not the most devastating lineup, like, Norfolk Tides, like, watching them devastate mm -hmm. the Charlotte Knights day after day. Like, that's a, that's kind of warped my standards in terms of, like, how good a minor league lineup can be. But when you look at the lineup that the Barons are putting out there, like, the outfield, if they want to put Wilfred Varis in a corner, like, they can. If they don't... They have an outfield of Terrell Tatum, Jacob Burke, and Duke Ellis, which is like a really fast outfield left it to right. Is. Covers a lot of ground. Like the infield is not bad. Like Brooks Baldwin is probably like the weakest link, and he's just somebody who just started playing shortstop. We don't know whether he's any good or not. It's a good kind of mystery to solve. But like Brian Ramos, good at third. Um, you know, Tim Elko, experienced first baseman. Uh, they have a mix of second baseman right now. Uh, you have like a catcher worth starting every day in Edgar Carroll, but like the backup catcher, Michael Turner, like he had a good OBP year last year in Winston Salem. So yeah, play him. Like every guy who's basically in the lineup aside from second base is worth, worth a look, worth a long look at double A and maybe second base is the weak link, but like you have Alessandro Womack, who's a lot of fun to watch. Like he's a favorite of mine just because like he's, He's a fire plug. He's like five eight and like two hundred and fifteen pounds or something like that. Like, yeah. He but he makes plays you don't think he can make, and like he's in to win it at the plate. Like he, you know, he draws walks. He bat flips after walks. So he's somebody who like really <laughs> enjoys winning battles, which I think you know the White Sox organization needs is somebody who gets really fired up about walks. Um, but like up and down the lineup, like it's a good team in terms of like it seems to fit well together. Uh, the players who are there mostly deserve playing. Like Jacob Burke is somebody who's gotten off to a slow start. Double A might be his wall, but it's worth like a month or two to see if like how well he can do. Like that's why it's like a good roster. And it, even if he's not hitting, he should be able to play like a good center field and help the team that way. So that's why like 
I was impressed by the roster, and then they went 3-0 and against the Chattanooga team, which is not quite the Chattanooga teams we've seen, like when the, the Reds were shoving through Ellie Dela Cruz and Matt McLean and uh, Marte and so forth. Like, they're a little bit thin now at AA uh, to where, like, 3-0 and against them isn't quite the feat that it was, but still, like, the Barons have struggled to beat anybody for stretches, so, like, seeing them handle three games and allow two runs. And I think, let me look at the box score here. Yeah. These two runs were earned. Uh, the first two earned runs of the series. Um, you know, that it, it's hard to, uh, you know, hard to really find nits right now. Yeah. Jared Kelly appeared. Andrew Dahlquist. These guys are still alive. But the, in the bullpen. prep pitchers, the White Sox taken. Yeah. Yeah. They're in the bullpen. They're on that path. So who impressed the most Jim? Because like over the weekend, was it Drew Thorpe? I mean, five scoreless yeah. innings, only two hits, one walk, and he struck out eight. Yeah, uh, I would say he was the most impressive. You know, obviously, he just had only had to play one game. Other guys had individually impressive games, and then, like, the next game wasn't, you know, amazing. But whereas Thorpe just had one and one. and uh, But he was, as advertised, like, just... 92 fastball, 82 changeup. That combination worked. He also had a slider well. He used that well, especially like backdooring it to uh, to lefties. Um, so he had the slider going in and then the changeup fading away. His fastball naturally has some cut on it. So you do have that like working horizontally both ways. Was able to get the fastball up in the zone with the changeup diving down. So like, yeah, he was doubling up on changeups, doubling up on changeups, two righties. Like a lot of like the classic Lucas Giolito usage, like when he and James McCann were in his heyday of throwing that change up whenever okay. he wanted. Uh, that's probably the easiest uh, comparison to make right now, just because the fastball, you know, looking at it as an individual pitch, like you look at 92, 93, like, eh, you know, it's kind of below average for a righty, but paired with the changeup, it really seemed like even though hitters were preparing for the changeup, they couldn't hit it. And because the changeup was in their mind, they were late on the fastball. The Barons only gave up four runs in the three game series against Chattanooga. And as Jim mentioned, maybe not that strong of a Chattanooga team, but again, only four runs allowed in the opening series. The Barons are three. zero. they have not made the postseason, folks. Since 2013, when Tim Anderson was in the Birmingham Barons. That's how long it's been of a playoff drought for the Barons. And I want to see this team make it to the postseason because they deserve some good success, Jim. Yeah, and should mention, too, that they, they won 8-2 to two on Sunday. I caught the first three innings and then had to drive back. Uh, but Chase Petty uh, was starting for Chattanooga. Chase Petty of the possible leaked Dylan Cease trade package. Like he was one of the pitchers that the, the White Sox wanted back and the Reds are like, no, you're, we're giving up too many good players, including Petty. And uh, he gave up four runs in uh, four innings. Like Elko took him off the wall in center. Uh, Brooks Baldwin uh, hammered a 92 mile per hour cutter out to center. So like, uh, you know, Petty was throwing like 98 and throwing a cutter at low nineties and they were able to do stuff with it. So that's what I mean like, in terms of just, you know, even though like Brian Ramos has kind of gotten off to a cold start, uh, Edgar Caro's had like productive at bats, even if they aren't like, you know, uh, leading to, you know, uh, a quality OPS, but like everybody seems like either they're contributing or if they're cold, the guy behind them is contributing to where like, you're not getting this white Sox problem of just, um, either quick innings or, uh, you know, issues with runners in scoring position to where, you know, runners and also I should say the team has a lot of speed. Like Terrell Tatum has scored uh, six runs in three games. Uh, wow. Duke Ellis, uh, he's getting on base a lot. And like when they're both on base, they, they create a lot of havoc. And, you know, that also leads to sloppy innings. You know, it, it's not necessarily a thing that can translate cleanly to AAA in the majors just because, the defenses aren't so easily stressed, but in double a it's like that kind of base running pressure when they can get on base, I think is something that can you know lead to sloppy innings uh, just because they aren't quite that polished to handle it. Like the pitchers are on the younger, more unrefined side. So maybe they're not great at holding runners yet and they can do a lot of damage. Well, the Barons travel, they'll be visiting the rocket city pandas in their next six game series You'll see that a lot in double A six game series as teams try to save money when it comes to travel costs, but you'll be able to catch up on all the minor league news 
on SoxMachine.com with Jim's minor keys every single day to track daily on how the minor league players are performing for the Chicago White Sox. But it is great to hear that the Birmingham Barons are off to a strong start in 2024. Make the postseason. I, I guess, is that the plan? What's the game plan for AA, Jim? Are they the guys that are pre- performing well? Are they just going to make a pit stop in Birmingham and in a month or two they're going to be in Charlotte? Like, do you, did you get a, a vibe? A Anyone give you insight on what the plan is for AA? It's it's hard to say. Like somebody like Drew Thorpe might only need like a handful of starts at Double A because he did pretty well at Double A last year uh, in his in his the brief audition there. So like you know, I also think with Thorpe, given that he's a fastball changeup guy and Double A hitters haven't seen a changeup like his, he might have to be you know as much as Charlotte I think is demoralizing for pitchers. He might be somebody who needs to face better hitters to like see how much can he get away with his like aggressive changeup usage versus like you know getting a little bit more out of his fastball or getting a little bit more out of a slider. I think that's going to be like the final mile for him uh, is learning just exactly how much more he needs from his other pitches to get by against you know quality against the best hitters in the world. Um, somebody like Brian Ramos, if he like assuming like this cold start is like not uh, you know going to last too long like you seem like somebody who could be promoted pretty quickly but like other guys like you know especially if you have this kind of uh glut in charlotte of players who might be called up to chicago or if they keep going through the waiver wire to find guys who might be able to help at the major league level like you could have like just a a complete churn in charlotte and the White Sox, I, I think it's a, a sore subject with them that they have finished so miserably in the organizational standings, especially when when your team is failing up top and your team is also failing down below. You just have nothing. And so, you know, you, you don't have winning anywhere. You don't have success anywhere. And, you know, Sergio Santos talking to him. I'll be writing about this a little bit more when I kind of combine the quotes because it was a theme talking to, to uh, some Barron's coaches. Because uh, Sergio Santos in the uh, in the Yankees, he managed two years in the Yankees in A ball, won a championship his first year, made it to the playoffs the second year. So he's used to winning. His only minor league managing has been winning, and it does seem like you know they, they probably at some point need to set up a firewall between the mess up top and good honest development down below. Like you don't want the emergency that's happening in Chicago to bleed into Charlotte, to bleed into Birmingham. And all of a sudden, like you have all your development goals scattered in the uh, goal of attempting to avoid the White Sox being the worst addition of themselves ever. And at some point, like you have to cut off the damage somehow and say like, you know, this is going to be bad. You're on your own. Uh, Let's regroup next year. And that's what I'm going to, I'm going to be curious about it. Like, Will they wait an entire half to try to win a first half championship to get the Barons into the playoffs, you know, guarantee them a spot and then second half of the season, you know, maybe shake it up a little bit and, uh, you know, and see exactly like, you know, make, make it more about like graduating guys who need to graduate and filling in the roster however you can. And then, uh, you know, figure out what happens when you get to the playoffs. But as long as they like have a shot at the playoffs, uh, with the first half record, I think you could see some promotions delayed, especially if it's like, why are we are, why are we going to throw them into Charlotte? Why are we going to demoralize them there? If the Knights look as bad as they've looked, you know, I don't want to rush judgment on Charlotte because Norfolk is good and it could be just like the worst possible first impression to be made against this team. I think, uh, you know, next week should tell us a little bit more about what kind of talent Charlotte has, but after next week, let's see like exactly uh, whether that's like a, a site that should be uh, very carefully considered for any promotions in the interim. <laughs> Otherwise, like Birmingham just might be a a safe space for a lot of people. Well, that's the Birmingham Barons. Let's get back to the White Sox. Previewing their, their next series quickly here. The Chicago White Sox are in Cleveland again. Solar Eclipse Day on Monday. So the start of this game has been pushed back to 4, 10 p.m. Central Time. This is the home opener for the Cleveland Guardians. The Guardians' fast start this season. They're 7-2, their first place in the American League Central. They have won four straight games. The pitching problems for this series. Cleveland will have Tristan McKenzie start on Monday. He had the roughest start to the season out of the Guardians starting pitchers. For the White Sox, 
to be determined. According to our James Fegan, expect the White Sox to announce a pitcher being called up for this start. Tuesday night, 5, 10 p.m. Central Time. As we mentioned earlier, lefty Logan Allen will be on the mound against Michael Soroka of the White Sox. Wednesday night, 5, 10 p.m. Central Time, Tanner Beebe will be making the start for Cleveland. And again, to be determined for the White Sox. Again, James is hearing the White Sox could be making another call up for that start. So two games, the White Sox are already scattered and shuffling to see and how they're going to fill out the starting rotation for this series as they want to be mindful of not overworking guys to start the year, but that is the problem when you're rolling with four starting pitchers right now and nine guys in the bullpen. But a big storyline for Cleveland, they got awful news. Shane Bieber, two outstanding starts to the season, now out for the rest of the season, needing Tommy John surgery. That is a huge loss for the Guardians, Jim. But as a team that's currently only allowing 2.33 runs per game, can the Guardians overcome this loss of Bieber? They're in the Central, so you have to account for that. And it's possible. Like, the Twins are having their own problems when it comes to health. And, you know, like, Bailey Ober has gotten crushed uh, by the Royals. Like, they've, they've, you know, have a little bit of, uh, you know, doubt about, like, whether their internal uh, replacements are what they thought they would be. Uh their bullpen that they thought was going to be dominant is banged up right now. So uh, they've kind of learned the White Sox lesson of like putting all your eggs in the off season uh, into the uh, bullpen basket is not really a great use of resources when like innings up top might be a little bit tough to come by or runs might be tough to come by. So the guardians, like they are good at scrambling. Uh, we know that uh, the one thing I guess I'm curious about is you know, this is Stephen Vogt's first year, and like he's off to a great start when it comes to just exactly, uh, you know, c- could expect more from him in terms of winning uh, three consecutive series. And, you know, it's one thing to win like three or four against Oakland, but then you have the Mariners and Twins who are postseason either, yeah, I would say contenders safely, like favorites, especially for the Twins, and, you know, taking care of business against them. Uh, like so far, like he's, he hasn't disturbed anything. So, uh, they're looking as sound as ever. It's just, you know, a matter, I think, with Bieber out of, like, what's the upside? Because I think, like, you know, with Bieber in there, like, that's how they win 90-plus games. With Bieber out of there, like, yeah, can they get to 90? Or is it a matter of, like, getting to mid-80s and hoping that's good enough and terrible division? Uh, that's kind of, like, my calculus right now because I know they've had some injuries in the minor league level as well. But uh, I've learned over the years to never count out – uh, the Guardians, just based on how resourceful they are and how good their development is and how good they are at just whipping up uh, pitchers who were second and third day draft picks or you know, position players who were international signings and be like, oh, here's a, uh, here's a guy who's a fourth starter, which is exactly what they need right now. Here's a middle infielder who uh, is good at defense and can hit, you know, luck into a, a 290 average for three months. That'll be useful uh, to, to score runs in front of Jose Ramirez. Like, they're pretty good at that. So that's why, you know, as long as, like, Vote is, you know, kind of that typical first-year manager without experience, like, just not that good, kind of like David Ross, you know, was, I think, the last example. Like, very charismatic, good with the media, but just, you know, never quite figured it out or never quite proved himself to be somebody who adds wins. I think that's going to be my biggest uh, question as they have to scramble now with Bieber being out. It's like one thing to... uh have a pretty simple job when Bieber is dealing and the rest of the rotation falls in line. But like McKenzie has been hurt before. So like if he has to miss some time and you have some dominoes topple, uh, how good will he be as a problem solver? Because we know Francona, uh, like when he was healthy, he was as good as it gets when it comes to just putting guys in a position to succeed, even if you're expecting very little from them. The hot hitters for Cleveland coming to this series, Stephen Kwan off to a very good start. He's hitting 349. Andres Jimenez, 294 with a 390 on base percentage, slugging 471. Of course, though, always watch out for Jose Ramirez and Josh Naylor. They always have big games against the White Sox, it seems, and that for that opening game on Monday against Tristan McKenzie. McKenzie for his career against the White Sox. The hitters that are in this lineup for the team combine 509 OPS against McKenzie. 
Hopefully they find some type of success, but as we already had a lengthy chat about the White Sox offense, I'm not expecting a lot of runs on Monday, so hopefully Tuesday and Wednesday go better for the White Sox. You know what's fascinating about this series to me is the Guardians are one of five teams with fewer homers than the White Sox offensively, and they are one of three teams with fewer walks than the White Sox, or or two teams, uh, when the Mariners are tied. But the Guardians are last in the league in walks, and they have six homers on the year. And when you look at their you know run production, it's like seventh. So I think like this is like what the White Sox thought they would be. <laughs> uh, you know, not power. You know, yeah, not drawing a ton of walks, but like being pesky and stringing hits together and not looking overwhelmed, being platoonable, a mix and match. And so like even if you don't you know think. Uh, tremendously if Paul DeYoung is a player, Paul DeYoung against lefties can be a threat once in a while. And like, that's kind of, I imagine how they pictured a fitting in right field with Fletcher and Pilar and they're not doing it, but the guardians are and guardians tend to do that to where like you look at their lineup. It's like Jose Ramirez is great. Josh Naylor sometimes gets on a roll. Who else is here? That's really dangerous. And then like you look at the end of the year and they're like middle of the pack and runs and it's like all BABIP and, uh, base running and uh, Jose Ramirez, and they're fine with that. Well, let's move over to the rest of Major League Baseball. Of course, we'll have the recaps. We'll also have the midweek podcast as well after the White Sox include their series against the Cleveland Guardians, and hopefully that goes a lot better than it did in Kansas City. Around Major League Baseball, just touch on these points real quick. Oakland is now moving to Sacramento starting the 2025 season. They will be there through the 2027 season. There is an option for the 2028 season. So this is the final year for the athletics being in Oakland. Jim, do you have any interest in attending any of the White Sox games when they play in Sacramento for the next three seasons? (laughs) I was thinking it's going to be like watching triple a baseball well, uh, with the rosters and with the uh, steam. Like it, it does feel, you know, it's kind of like the uh, coyotes in Arizona yeah. uh, playing in Arizona state's arena, like 4,500 seats. I think that's probably relative. Um, maybe Sacramento is a little bit bigger now that MLB stadiums are getting a little bit smaller, but you're looking at like a third to a quarter of the usual seating capacity. And People go to Coyotes games and think, wow, it's really cool to watch the NHL up this close. But also, like, it feels cheap. And it feels like uh, this shouldn't be happening. Um, You can appreciate the skill, but, like, it just, the, it doesn't feel professional. It doesn't feel like the best hockey has to offer. And I think probably Sacramento will feel the same way. Kind of like when the Blue Jays were doing their uh, United States tour uh, during the pandemic year, yep. or uh, just because uh, Toronto hadn't opened up all the way. So they had to like make do in uh, Dunedin and Buffalo. And it's like, in that case, you had a legitimate excuse and, you know, international politics and such. So you understood the circumstances that it took to have them playing there, you know, mostly in front of no fans and being like, yeah, it's, it is what it is. We're all just getting by. We're all just trying to get uh, through these seasons as best as we can. And nobody held it against them. And it's just like, oh, it's kind of interesting to see MLB players in a minor league park. This is all self-inflicted, like a series of bad choices and bad priorities. And so I think while it will be kind of cool to see players up that close or not have like a bad seat in the house, I think the novelty will wear off pretty quickly and you're realizing, especially the the A's continue looking as bad as they've looked, um, it'll just feel like this is all the result of chronic corner cutting. And it really is a is just a symptom of every you know, a lot of bad choices, both that John Fisher's made and the league has made as well. Star pitchers getting hurt. A very hot topic, especially on social media. We talked about Bieber, Spencer Strider. We're expecting official bad news for the Atlanta Braves, possibly getting his second Tommy John. Thoughts and prayers to all those that had Spencer Strider and El Cy Young bets for this year. Uh, looks like that he'll be missing the rest of the 2024 season. And like I mentioned, Jim, a lot of commentary about this topic. Even the Major League Baseball Players Association released a statement as from a MLBPA point of view, they're blaming the pitch clock. 
I don't think it's that simple. I think with these types of injuries, there's the chase. So many pitchers at a young age are aiming for greater velocity and spin because you have yahoos like me that cover the MLB draft that are looking for this type of velocity and spin and explaining to people who don't watch college baseball or follow the prep showcases of, yeah, this is why you want to give this guy $7 million in the first round. So parents have been chasing this dream for their children for a while, whether that's in college scholarships or possibly become a professional baseball player and an instant millionaire. But with this greater velocity and spin, especially at a younger age, so many pitchers before they even get to the major leagues have already had Tommy John surgery. So I think we just are watching a game at this point of the history of the sport where more elbows are ticking time bombs than ever before. What are your thoughts about this particular topic? Because I know over the years of podcasts, we've had so many people come on the show writing books about this topic, about pitcher injuries continue to increase. And here we are, no Shane Bieber and probably no Spencer Strider for the rest of the season. All signs point to velocity. Like I think the pitch clock probably is... Maybe accelerant is too strong of a word, but it doesn't help. Like, I think that's why the game was slowing down is because, like, recovery was important for pitchers. So, like, you just had this thing of never-ending velocity and then never-ending recovery. And so the game was just uh, slowing down. I think one of the hopes was that with the pitch clock, pitchers would have to learn how to conserve a little bit. But one, they haven't because, like, just the... Easiest way to be replaced, I think, is to be a major league pitcher is trying to like get by throwing 92, 93 when you can throw 96, 97. And then like if you have a bad month, all of a sudden the guy who's been throwing 96, 97 in AAA and whose innings are carefully managed because AAA teams are all about development, like they get called up. And so it is very much like a a very dog eat dog uh, system on the pitching side to where like they can't afford to let up. And can't afford to like slip into burly mode and throw, you know, 87, 88 every 11 seconds and be healthy for 10 years. So you have this conflict that I think is, you know, irresolvable. Like the, the one solution I've thought of, it's probably too stupid to write, is uh, just be nice to have two drafts, one for hitters or position players and like one for pitchers and like pitchers can't be drafted before they're 25. <laughs> like if you want to pitch, like we're not even going to scout you until you're like 22 because it's just, it's bad for your health. It's bad. It's illegal. Like, um, they just use like machines in, in, uh, in high school, uh, just dial it up. You have a, you have a pitcher in the dugout. who's sequencing or a catcher who's uh, hitting the buttons to like, you know, sequence hitters with the uh, machines, but otherwise, uh, you know, just pitching is, is banned because that's kind of what it seems like has to be done in order to kind of like, uh, to diminish the incentives that cause this very, it seems like, uh, just negative feedback loop to just where, you know, you have to keep making dangerous choices in order for the biggest payoff. I think it is going to have ramifications. We already saw it in this past free agency class. I think for all those starting pitchers chasing the Garrett Cole deal, or he just recently made his announce, a retirement announcement, Steven Strasburg. I don't see those types of contracts anymore for starting pitchers after this season. Well, Yamamoto just signed one. so Yeah, well, that's the Dodgers. I mean, yeah, the Dodgers yeah. maybe, but the rest of the baseball. Or maybe it's just like one guy gets that. One guy every five years or something yeah, the, like that. Yeah, the 25-year-old that hasn't had any arm issues whatsoever practices throwing a javelin as part of their warm up. Yeah. We'll give that guy 12 years, but everybody else that's actually pitched in the major leagues before. No, uh, maybe we'll see caps and starting pitcher contracts at five years, which is a form of collusion. But again, I, I can't blame teams if they want to, they don't mind giving high salaries for years, but it's hard to make these types of commitments when the, this level of injury can knock you out for 12 to 14 months. So that eats up a season and maybe a little bit even into the next season. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but I don't, I don't know how the the league or the sport itself walks it back because velocity is king right now. And that's how these pitchers are getting batters out. Lastly, anything else catching your attention when watching major league baseball, Jim? 
the Marlins are kind of a mess. Big time mess. Uh, especially, <laughs> yeah, since we're watching them uh, with Jake Berger and also Tim Anderson, like uh, pretty gross. Like the Mets got off to a bad start, and it's always entertaining when the Mets are Metsing. Uh, it's 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 their thing. In uh, in as a White Sox fan, you have uh, no reason to judge, but as a White Sox fan, you also have like you're attracted to Rex and that's one of them. So uh, I think uh, negatively, uh, I think those are what's grabbed my attention. Like the pirates look feisty. Like that's kind of fun uh, when they're good, just because the, those mm-hmm. fans deserve better and that park deserves better. So happy to see when like the pirates are, you know, pirating in a good way. Like they, uh, you know, everybody's waiting for Skeens and like, Oh, here are two more good pitchers besides Skeens uh, who, you know, Skeens might be supplementing when he's called up. Like that's, that's fun. So uh, kind of rooting for them. Yeah. That's what is catching my attention. The national league central has been very fun. The Chicago Cubs and their fans are having a lot of fun to start the year. They're six and three. That's a great start for them. They played very well against the Los Angeles Dodgers. The Cubs are in third place <laughs> despite starting 63 because the Pirates are hot again to start the year. They're eight and two. The Milwaukee Brewers are six and two. Every team in the National League Central is 500 or better to start this season. I don't think overall they're going to be the best division in Major League Baseball, but I think it's going to be the most competitive division in Major League Baseball, which will make it a lot of fun. It'll make it very stressful weeks for our friends, especially in Chicago, that are Cubs fans. They're having fun now, but when they look at the standings, they're like, we're in third place? Come on. <laughs> Everybody else cool off. But yeah, it's a lot of fun right now to see on how the National League Central has been starting in 2024. Oh, the other thing that's grabbed my attention is uh, poor Jose Abreu. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you looked at his numbers yet. Uh, two for 27, nine strikeouts, 074 average and slugging, 212 OPS. So he'd fit right there. in, but like the, the Astros have been wobbly and very wobbly. Yeah. So it's a case of the run differential isn't terrible. So it seems like they're, they're a little bit of bad luck there. They've had some brutal bullpen losses, especially in that opening series against the Yankees. So the Yankees have been hot. The Astros have been. Uh, a little bit rickety. And I think like you could easily flip those series to be like, oh, they're both 500. Uh, it's that early in the samples or that small, but like Jose Abreu was able to like kick out of the pin last year uh, and, and salvage his season, have a nice postseason, and, and prove his worth. But like another first half like this, I think is going to have people looking at like the remainder, like the back half of the contract and be like, oh, this is uh, the Astros are no longer a well-oiled machine. No, uh, there's already talks about benching him. So hopefully that's not the case for old friend Jose Abreu. But that will do it for this episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. And hopefully the Chicago White Sox start playing better. So the tone of this podcast isn't that awful (laughs) or dour. Then again, yeah. we could always switch gears it'll and cover the Barons. In... <laughs> yeah. Well, it'd be a, it'll be a week until I can see uh, Winston Salem in Bowling Green. So maybe we'll get some you know, firsthand Noah Schultz looks and, and talk about that for a week and that we can cross it off the calendar. Just score some runs, damn it. That's it. That's all we we're asking yep. for. Be confident. Fun bad. <laughs> be confident. Fun bad. <laughs> But that will do it again. That will do it for this episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. If you just discovered the show, you can subscribe to the Sox Machine Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts such as Spotify and Apple Music. You can watch our videos at youtube.com slash Sox Machine and follow us on social media. We're on every platform at Sox Machine. You can follow me at Sox Machine underscore Josh. And of course, follow James at J.R. Fegan. Again, huge thanks to all of our Patreon supporters, which you could become one if you want full access of all of our coverage of the Chicago White Sox at patreon.com slash Sox Machine. Monthly plans start at just $5. And we also have different tiers of support, which you get additional benefits to go along with that. So again, you can sign up at patreon.com slash Sox Machine. The Sox Machine Podcast is a production of SoxMachine.com. You're on for all things Chicago White Sox baseball and part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. Alongside Jim Margulis, I'm Josh Nelson. Thanks for listening and watching.
for the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile, and the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time, there's Granger, offering professional grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, clickgranger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.